Um, in the interest of time, we'll just keep moving and we'll move on to Dr. David Routledge, who's from the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. So David is UK trained clinical haematologist and he has a specialist interest in haematological cancers and bone marrow transplantation. And that includes treating cancer patients in their own homes. Uh, David's currently a consultant at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and the Royal Melbourne Hospital and University Hospital Geelong. And he's actively involved in early phase clinical trials and is a senior clinical fellow at the University of Melbourne. Um, David's gonna tell us uh, managing patients with acute leukemia using here. David, thank you. All right, I hope you can see my slides. Thanks, James. Um, so yeah, so I got asked to do acute leukemia, um, but I'm gonna also talk about some of our other problems. So I sort of made it more about hematological cancers. Um, and mine sort of an adult perspective, but it was really interesting seeing Gabrielle's talk about some of the things that I'm doing by chance that actually fall under her guidelines. So I maybe should catch up with Gabrielle and learn some more. Um, so, Slides going. Right, there we go. So, um, look, chemo, hematological cancers have always required very high dose chemotherapy. It's, it's very different um, to some of the other cancer therapies. And one of the things, you know, that we do at Peter Mac, um, Royal Melbourne, is autologous bone marrow transplant and uh, allergen air transplant. By the time they get to come and see us, some of these patients have spent months and months and months in the hospital. Um, so, you know, we've always been looking at ways to try and improve the journey for these patients. And the truth is that supportive care is so good, as you can tell from Gabrielle's talk, that patients really can be managed in, in the home in some sort of shape or form. And what we can do there is always a, a good thing. Um, so, look, we've partnered uh, with the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Home Team. Um, we got a new place just across the road. And the idea was to deliver the high dose chemotherapy or at least the supportive care for those patients at home. We got a grant from WICMIX, which is our sort of cancer alliance. Um, and the idea there was to improve the coordination and care for patients. And the, the most mature programs we've got at the moment are the, the Fludarabine at home, which is for our, um, part of our flu mel transplants, and that's five days delivered at home. And now our melphalanatologous program, but also our supportive care stuff. Um, so where we are, you know, Melbourne in the news quite a lot recently but uh, we're sort of based that bang in the middle but we go pretty much out to the west 40 kilometers um but due to some of the innovations we've managed to do we're now recently inching out to the east um and digital innovation has been one of the things that we've been able to do um to let us do that so our the HIF program for the allograft program as i say started that in 2011 um Patients have chemotherapy delivered at home by the hospital and the home nurses from day minus six to day minus two through a, a Hickman line. Very easy to be done. The patients are in the hospital, they're actually that bored, they wander around. Um, and then they get their Melphalan on day minus two. I've been trying for years to get Melphalan delivered, but essentially the roads in Australia aren't good enough and it gets too hot in the back of a car. So it's only stable for an hour, so we can't do that. And stem cells have always got to be delivered in a hospital environment, unfortunately due to regulations and things. So we've had 162 patients through the program up until 2019 when I last did it. A variety of patients with leukemia, lymphoma, um, aplastic anemia. The length of stay with the program has been no different to the inpatients. Um, but we do save five bed days with those chemotherapy days from the hospital. In the entire time of the program, we've had 11 unplanned admissions over that time. So a very low readmission rate. Um, and we've saved over 750 bed days. So it's a significant thing for what is very simple to deliver as a 15 minute infusion as a push. Um, interestingly, yeah, so I did some maths on that. It's probably at least $300,000 we saved the hospital in that time, which is simple money for the department and pays for a couple of nurses essentially. Um, in regards to the unplanned admissions, we've had a suspected infection in most of those cases, but only one positive blood culture. Um, and these are heavily pre-treated patients, vasovagal and anxiety just with the patient not being happy at home. And really, more, four of those admissions happened in the first three months of the program, and we've only had seven over the following eight years. So we generally only have a readmission rate of one person a year. And we do about 140 allografts a year, so it's pretty low. What everybody worries about with the unplanned admission, 
panic, chaos. But the truth is, it's very much more calm and collected. Okay. There's no effect on our overall survival. Um, so it's safe. We haven't had any problems with it. Um, yeah, so look, that's been successfully done. And from the back of that, everybody's got a bit of confidence because I think a lot of it is, you know, you've got to get your confidence up with people. So we started doing our uh, Melphalan autographs at home. We do those for myelomas and we do those for lymphomas um, using Melphalan chemotherapy. And we sort of had to build it up in stages. There was a lot of pushback from colleagues and from nurses and day ward teams. You can't be doing this. This is really dangerous. So we thought best thing to do is make it really simple, show everybody it works and just do it in little steps. So we did four phases. First phase was the chemotherapy on the ward, on the day ward. The patient went home overnight, came back, had their stem cells and then was admitted electively that day. Second phase was going hospital in the home uh, until four days after their stem cells. So staying out of that four days afterwards and then planning your admission. The first, the third phase was keeping it completely out. And the fourth phase was my dream, pie in the sky, giving them alpha line, how hard can it be? Um, but unfortunately, as I say, it's just not stable in the back of a car and the heat and things upset it. So I've, never, I've not actually been able to do that. So this is just a sort of a scheme to show you how we do it. Okay, so day minus one, day zero on a Thursday and a Friday. Um, patients then have reviews on a Saturday and Sunday by the hospital and the home team twice a day, morning and evening. Monday mornings, Phase two, they were coming in to see the consultant. We do a myeloma consultant ward round uh, on, a on a Monday and a Thursday. So that's linking in with the teams. Back on the hospital on the home, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and then uh, back on the hospital on the home. And we just keep repeating that cycle until they get the neutrophils back and they're discharged. Um, it's good to have the Monday and Thursday review because they get caught up with the consultant team. We know about them. So if something's a bit odd or we're not happy about it, we can give the Hith guys some advice um, and, um, and they can ask questions as well. So phase one, we had three patients come through, um, six bed days saved, one patient admitted pyrexial. He was actually a naughty patient. He had a temperature at home and he didn't tell us. So patients, unfortunately, even though you do the right thing and you educate them, they will lie to you because they don't want to come into hospital. And that was something we learned within our first part of the program. Uh, phase two was, again, eight patients admitted on day plus four, 37 bed days saved. And again, one patient admitted on day plus two with a temperature, but again, culture negative um, and, uh, and they have nausea as well. Uh, phase three, uh, we must be pushing 40, above 40 patients now. Um, Bed day safe, 294. We've had people stay out and never come into the hospital, which is fantastic. Um, and we've saved over 294 bed days. The commonest reason is a temperature or diarrhea that we're not just keeping up with their uh, fluid input. And if I speak to my Spanish colleagues, they tell me they never readmit anybody, um, but you guys will understand this. They go on prophylactic tazacin infusions three times a day and they go on steroids to hide their fever. So I, I think they essentially are treated for neutropenic sepsis when they haven't got it. And that's how they managed to never admit anybody. Um, the other things we have going, uh, we've, I developed, I've learned these programs three years ago. So for the leukemia patients, we have ALL patients um, and they have hypersevad and they have their chemotherapy as an inpatient and then go on to get discharged to be monitored uh, for neutropenia uh, and any infection. Very easy with the A cycles, the B cycles are a bit tougher because there's a bit stronger chemo in there. Um, the other thing we've done is cons post consolidation chemotherapy for the AMLs. And again, chemo is an inpatient and neutropenic monitoring. I actually have a program to develop and deliver the chemotherapy at home. But the main issue is actually being pharmacy funding, um, a dedicated pharmacist to ensure that this is all delivered and done properly and checked. And, you know, one of the good things that's come out of COVID is the chief executive turned up and said, why are you treating all these patients in the hospital? What can I do to get them out? And we said, oh, we need a pharmacist. And shock horror, overnight we got funding for a pharmacist. So we're now busy putting these programs together to actually deliver the chemotherapy at home so the patient may have helped out the whole treatment. So something good has come out of uh, COVID. And the other one we do is the arsenic trioxide and atria. Um, that's an infusion over two hours. Now, some people's uh, HIF teams can't stay for that long, um, different reasons. But um, 
the reason why we, we generally have a rule of if it doesn't save an inpatient bed, we don't do it. So if it's going to be a day ward bed saved, there's no point. Um, but the IV arsenics can't be delivered on the weekend on the day ward because we haven't got a 24 hour day, uh, seven day day ward, which is a bit shocking for such a quaternary hospital at Peter Mac. But that's just the way it is. Um, so we end up admitting these people to our ward 7B to deliver this chemotherapy and the HIF team take that on for us to stop, stop that from happening, which is great for the patients. The other thing we do is a lot of supportive care. Okay, so in antiviral therapy, we get a lot of CMV reactivations in our allograft patients and the HIF team can deliver our IV gancyclovirs and Foscarnet therapies, which would normally require admission even replacing electrolytes and abnormalities as we go with the Foscarnet patients. Um, they do palifermin for us, which is a uh, keratinocyte growth factor that we use for protecting the gastrointestinal tract, so protecting mucositis, they deliver that for us. And they also do um, early discharge and intravenous antibiotics. So I've called it inter intermediate risk because I don't think our patients quite fall sometimes in the high risk or the low risk. Um, and the idea, the principle basically is at 48 hours, if your blood filters are negative and you're well and you haven't had a temperature, you can go home on intravenous antibiotics. So that's what I was saying before about Gabrielle's. We sort of ended up there without even really following a proper protocol, but I, I liked her ideas. So I think I'll start to introduce those to mine. Well, what are the advantages? Well, look, it's great for the hospital. Okay, It breaks new ground. It changes lives. The hospital loves it. Um, you've been innovative, um, it's so much better for the patients and you actually empower the patients as well because they're involved in their own care, they can be doing their observations and things like that and it's really good from that point of view. Uh, financially we're always better off, as I say we take the, the Royal Melbourne HIF team as an inpatient unit, um, I know funding is different elsewhere, I gave some talks to New South Wales for example and it doesn't really, the money doesn't follow the patient quite so well as it does in Victoria um cost of the hospital is roughly eight hundred dollars for a his bed versus twelve hundred dollars for a bed that's our costings at royal melbourne it may be different at your hospitals um and the other thing for me is really it's the capital works you're not building a new ward you know the ward is the most expensive thing in terms of building um from that point of view it's an extremely flexible system you can flex up or flex down to, to deal with your patients and that's been really helpful during covid um, or with the winter flu season is the same as well. Patients, they're cared for at home. Um, they're previously in hospital for several weeks. As I say, it empowers them. Um, and look, we've asked carers, and we thought the things we worry about was care fatigue because the carer has to be with them 24 hours a day with our program. And they think it's great as well. Um, we've also started looking at digital innovation, as I've said, and that's to try and improve our resources. So can we do more reviews remotely? And that means the nurses don't have to go so far so then they can see more patients. Um, and as I said before, it's enabled us to sort of expand our program to the east side of Melbourne, which is where our competition is, um, and be uh, pinching patients from elsewhere. Um, which has been really good because we do get a lot of patients from Cabrini who come to us for an autograph and then they go uh, have to stay in the hospital because we just can't go east in Cabrini as James will tell you is very close to us but it's always been a bit sort of counterintuitive that we can't go to those areas yet we can go 40 kilometers out to the west um, from that point of view. Issues we had well buy-in of key partners has always been a problem skepticism of our colleagues oh they're all going to diagram negative sepsis you can't do that you'll be getting sued one of the comments I got made. Um, big issues about where's our funding going to. So Royal Melbourne doesn't lose out as a hospital because the funding switched from the haematology department to the HIF department. But um, the um, you have to make your managers understand that then we can see more patients and do more things and do clinical trials. And, you know, these immune therapies, they often require bed admissions. The patients get CRS neurotoxicity, ICU beds required, they're not risk free. And obviously, as I said before, telling them that you can build a new ward without spending the money on the ward. You've got just, you need the doctors and the nurses and some cars and some pharmacists. Um, and that's what I was talking about without going to East Melbourne. And, but the hospital wasn't interested in that until we could prove that, that we we're going to benefit it. So we had to stretch the service first and then show we could do it. And then we got some funding. 
communication is essential to make these things work. If you don't communicate properly, it all falls apart. Our hematology inpatient registrar contacts the hospital and the home registrar at four o'clock and says, how's your day been? Any problems with our two patients? They say, no, great. Um, we've just got a new electronic medical record called EPIC. It literally is EPIC and it is amazing. All our inpatient notes are on there. I can see what the observations are doing, even if my patient's under the hospital and the home team. So, you know, and I can see what the nurse is doing or not, or the nurse hasn't done. It's fantastic. One of the other problems we had was where to admit the patient if they were unwell. And because they do get unwell and they need to be admitted to the hospital. And we persuaded them to let our patients be treated as open on the table, i.e. emergency surgery, need a bed on ICU, they need a bed now. Um, and so they're at the highest priority for admission. We also have a variety of backup spaces. Can they go to the hematology ward 5A? If not, can they go to another ward 7B? If not, AMU. So we've got this whole system that we go down the list for. And the last thing we've been doing, which is there's no evidence for, but it's got, we're giving an emergency ciprofloxacin dose to the patient. So they phone up, they say they've got a temperature of 39 degrees. We say, right, come into the hospital. We tell them to set that tablet there. And then, so at least they've got some antibiotic on board for the gram negatives that our patients tend to have. It's made everybody else feel a bit safer. Um, and yeah, at least the patient's getting some antibiotic on board there. And then but I didn't really want to put them on cipro prophylaxis full term just because of all the resistance we could drive and things. And lastly, as I said before, patients do not always tell you the truth. They ignore their symptoms, they come in clapped out and you end up smacking your head in the middle of the night going, why didn't they just come in earlier? We talked about what's our funding, which is the WIS, um, and making the managers understand that was a real hard bit. But you know, WIS, what the, the principles behind it was that access should be equitable for all, Patients, it should be patient care provided, not provider provided, so not for the doctor. It should be effective. It should be evidence-based, which you've seen a lot of that in the previous talk. It should be technically efficient, sustainable, and accountable. And in my eyes, it covers all those areas. We've started going into digital innovation, uh, remote monitoring of patients. This is something we were planning before COVID, but COVID's just helped push it forward. Um, see more people with the same number of staffs, reduce number of physical visits, cover more areas. One of the key things is detecting unwell patients earlier and therefore reducing complications. The patient who lies can't hide. If they have a temperature, I will see it on the, on the software. And we can also collect patient recorded outcomes such as do they sleep better at home and things like that. And also you empower the patients, you give them direct care in their own care. It can also help us deliver health to people in regional areas. There's no reason why someone at Peter Mack can't talk to somebody in a regional area and look after them now. Okay. And I think that's very important with Australia the way it is. There's lots of people who are a long way away and outcomes in cancer are a lot worse in um, our rural colleagues, our rural patients, sorry. So we've been using these devices, they're TGA approved, which means it's not a clinical trial. If you want to use one that's not been TGA approved, you're technically running a clinical trial. There's lots of industrial partners and we've been working with the University of Melbourne as well. The issues potentially are that not everyone in Australia has a good internet connection. I think it's getting better, but it's still the case. People argue that not everyone is internet savvy, but um, my 72 year old mother can uh, it's got an iPad and things and can work that well. So I, I think that's a bit unfair. These things, you've got to be very careful which one you pick because you want it to be able to be integrated with your electronic medical record. You want to store the data, you want to extract the data, you want to do some research with it. Patients have to be able to use the equipment. So it's going to be simple, dexterity. And as I said, ongoing funding issues for it. Once you've maybe got a grant to buy these things, who maintains them, who replaces them. The other thing we've been looking at is teletrials. So this allows us to do give regional patients a trial, but they don't have to come to Peter Mac. You can have the primary investigator at Peter Mac and also a satellite investigator. You can have remote parameters done and reduce the follow-up visits in hospital and the home people could do this as well. And this all leads to improvement in the patient's cancer journey. Example of the model we use, we might be the primary site, but we do everything. Satellite site number three may be somewhere like Cabrini, where we have got some partnerships where they do some of the investigations. 
satellite one might just literally be giving the drug and taking some blood tests and satellite two might be just doing blood tests. So really, you know, it's a real helpful thing and, this, and hospital and the home can do many of these things. And that's me. Uh, I was gonna ask any questions, but I think we're gonna leave them till the end. Thanks, David, that's great. And yep, bang, bang on time, well done. <laughs>